So Fonda Lee is here to talk to us about the great mysteriousness that is writing a trilogy on I Should Be Writing episode, oh boy, 75 and season 17. Well, I should be writing. That's a lot of episodes. I know, I know. I, uh, yeah, since I started doing Twitch, I've been doing consistently twice a week. And so that's why I've done 75 episodes this year. It's, it's been amazing. So, uh, hi there, everyone. Welcome to I Should Be Writing. This is the podcast for wannabe fiction writers that streams twice weekly on Twitch, twitch.tv slash mightymer. It is November. It is NaNoWriMo time. I believe my number, I should have gotten it. I forgot to update the chat thing. Damn it. Anyway, my numbers are like 2200 or something. I'm not at the 3333 that you're supposed to be at today, but I'm not at zero. So I'm calling that a win. I'm very excited to have Fonda Lee on the show to talk about her upcoming trilogy ender. Fonda, how are you? I'm doing well. I am not doing nano this year. <laughs> I, I have a book coming out in 28 yeah. days and I looked at my calendar and I was like, nano is not an option this year. Yeah. That, <laughs> Thank that you for a... having me on the show. I'm super excited to be Oh, here. sure. I'm, I'm excited to have you here. It's uh, It's been funny because I... A lot of years before, I would have a project either have to start in the middle of or end in the middle of, or I was 30,000 words into something and couldn't really do nano. But this year, it's like I got everything set correctly, and the way my schedule works out is I can try something shiny and new and different. So I'm just kind of doing a fun project for a little while, which is, you know, what I've been working on. I... uh still high on turning in two major projects last week and then uh doing some freelance work and then started yesterday last night actually on my nano novel so that's what i've been up to you want to tell us what you've been up to fonda well uh, heading towards the finish line on launching this book which um takes up an extraordinary amount of time uh, anyone who's who has launched a book can tell you uh, there's all these author admin things that include events and interview questions and pre-order campaign yeah. and just all of that stuff ends up um, consuming your life for a while. Uh, and this year I did kind of a bunch of different things because obviously I finished off the Greenbone Saga, then I wrote a novella in the Greenbone Saga world, and then I wrote another novella which has not been announced yet. And then I wrote a bunch of short fiction, which I'm releasing on Patreon. And now I'm working on the proposal for my next series. And I had thought, okay, I want to try and like at least get a good chunk of that done by the end of the year. But at this point, I'm almost just throwing up my hands and saying, let's just get, let me get to the end of the year and launch this book and um, hit it fresh in January. That's, that's a lot of stuff. <laughs> that's, that's really a lot of stuff. I hope you, uh, you get a chance to rest in December or will you still be on like author, uh, virtual book tour type mode? I mean, it will, I will be for the first few weeks of December because, um, the book comes out November 30th in the U S December 2nd in the UK. So there'll be things going on that first week and then I'm going to Worldcon. Are you going to Yay! Worldcon? Yes, yes, I'm going Yay! to Worldcon. Yeah. Yay! So it'll be that'll be exciting, and then, um, and then it's the holidays, so it's going to be kind of just a sprint to the end, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You listen, listen to my day two podcast. I'll release it later today when I talk about that weird feeling of already feeling behind and that you can't catch up when really you're just thirty three hundred words behind. We, we kind of had this little group last night of me and Todd and uh, Space Valkyries talking about how we none of us had started by about 9.30 Eastern. <laughs> and, and Shale was uh, there too. And, and 
but but she's got three hours on us, so we were all kind of starting Nano late at night on the first. So it was that's the one thing I love about this thing is the camaraderie. Suddenly everybody's got the same goals and working on the same time period, and some people run away really fast, but there's usually several people that are somewhere where you are in your word count, and that makes it kind mm-hmm. of kind of friendly. Yeah. And November is a hard month. It is. Under, like, the best of circumstances. So yeah. Nano is is always, like, this additional layer to, yeah. to consider. But I do want to say the nice thing about Nano is that it creates this structure that, like, even if you don't win Nano, and I, yeah. I don't think the goal is ever to win Nano. I have never, by the way, for anyone who's listening to doing Nano, I have never won Nano ever. <laughs> I am and so glad you I said that. I have six that. published books, so you can absolutely be a real writer and suck at Nano. I suck at Nano. I've um, never won. I've never won yeah. either. <laughs> this never. feels like such a fun confession area. Yay! <laughs> yeah, yeah. Nano losers. So Yay! I could, uh, I could, I could start a Nano losers club. I actually did a, a blog post um, that I. I re- if I recall, is on Chuck Wendig's Terrible Minds post mm-hmm. about um, how I failed Nano um, and how the actual, like, the fast first drafting that Nano encourages just doesn't work for everyone. It definitely mm-hmm. doesn't work for me. Um, and so if it doesn't work for you, uh, that's totally fine. You can still be a real writer. And if it does work for you, that's great. And if you're, if you're somewhere in between where you just want to use Nano as a community um building opportunity and a way to keep yourself accountable if you want to do like a half nano and say like mm-hmm. hey if i hit 30,000 words this month that is 30,000 words i didn't have at the beginning yes um, that's great too exactly so many different ways to approach nano everything from all in to part way in to run screaming away from and they're all valid yes yes exactly thank you for that uh, kids are asleep is a municipal liaison and an awesome cheerleader. The more the month is left, the more you have to catch up. All right, so uh, real quick, good news. Um, I like I said, I'm still high from from the good news last week. I'm I'm finished. I've been carrying those projects around. I was fond of one context. I wanted to be done with it. My plan was to be done with both of these, a novel and a novella, in April, and take a good part of May off and they both kept coming back with edits over and over again. It was like massive blow to the little bit of confidence I'd built up and it was a rough summer just, and you know, I, I didn't disagree with a lot of it. I think they did, you know, they did what the editor's supposed to do and help make it stronger, but it was rough. So having those yeah. two finally gone end of October is just magical. And I'm having a lot of fun writing my new, I'm trying my hand at a psychological thriller. So, uh, cause why not? So, uh, That's it's, exciting. Al- it's also based on Stardew Valley. So I'm going to have to file off some, uh, some, uh, uh, what is it? Serial numbers. That's what we say. File off the serial numbers before I actually say it's a book. But uh, I'm having fun writing psychological thriller Stardew Valley fanfic. That's oh. what I'm doing. Well, I I mean, you did psychological thriller uh, vibes really well in six weeks. So oh, thank you. I think this is like, I, I, I totally see how, how you're going to kick ass on this one. Aw, thank you. Uh... Bail Who Bites Cats has made the stream. Well well done. Hey, Kimmy did first blackout poem of the month last night. Hitting the yay button. Oh, 3,500 words. Is that right? Numbers Ninja? Is that what Star-Eyed Green me, uh, is at? Uh, Shell got the developmental edit back to the editor with 12 hours to spare. That is that is hard. Well done. So, more more confetti. I love how the confetti comes down. Yes, I like the confetti a lot. By the way, my merch store is open. I have yet to put a button here for it, but uh, I I did, as you guys requested, I did create a yay button. So you can buy a button with confetti that says yay, and a hat, and I think a duvet cover, because why not? (laughs) So, uh, yeah, the, the... 
the merch store is open, and uh, I will try to remember to put a link in it. It was we hit some unex the unexpected audio crap kind of threw me off, so I think that um, was the problem. I have one good news in email. That's what I'm looking for right now. Um, uh, Fonda, did you have anything you wanted to uh, give for good news beyond the fact that you have a major book coming out at the end of the month? Oh, hmm. Gosh. Um, I mean, my more recent good news is special editions of my trilogy Ooh. Uh, that are being put out by um, Illumicrate. And I am just so excited about them. They're, uh, they are, they've got these new redesigned covers. They're naked hardbacks with foil. They have sprayed mm. edges. So I'm just like gleeful about getting, um, I don't know what, I just, I have a thing for beautiful books. Oh yeah. Now, like the one that, and, and so many people read, you know, eBooks and audiobooks these mm -hmm. days, but there's still just something so special about the physical book, especially when it's, beautiful and has great paper and has sprayed yeah. edges so that's what i'm excited but i haven't seen it um you know any more than anyone else has so that's what i'm i'm, I'm like eagerly awaiting that's very edition. exciting very cool um kickstarter kids are asleep in just launched that's my yay jasmine voted thank you for continuing to keep our democracy on the rails i hope uh and Winter Jacket arrived. Fancy books are rad. One more yay button for all the things and all the things people didn't feel comfy to talk about. And uh, Valerie says, I listen to your podcast all the time. Haven't been able to hit it live on Twitch. Here's my good news email. Finished book two in my series and published it today. Um, probably about your age. So I also want to say book two, Electric Boogaloo. Awesome. <laughs> Very good. Congratulations, Valerie. And, uh... Anybody else who's got news or just needs needs an applause? Sometimes we just need applause, you know. So I am. I, I've I've been wanting to have you on to talk about the whole trilogy thing. So let's do the proper marketing thing. Tell us about your amazing trilogy, the third of which comes out this month, and I've. I'll, well, I'll grab your book co cover and put it on the screen. So the Greenbone Saga is an epic urban fantasy, Asia-inspired gangster family saga. And I have uh, described it on a few occasions as the Godfather with magic and kung fu. Um, <sighs> but the first book came out in 2017. That was Jade City. And um, it went on to win the World Fantasy Award, and it got optioned for development as a TV series at Peacock. We gotta hit that button again. Yay! Yay, confetti! And then Jade War came out in 2019, and now, four years later, the third and final book, Jade Legacy, is coming out. Um, so, it has been a, an incredible journey. It has, it's been, for me, seven years of working mm -hmm. on this trilogy, so it feels like uh, I have been living and breathing, sleeping this trilogy for a long time. Yeah. And it feels great to be finally sending out the, the book, the completed trilogy out into the world. That's excellent. And we've had, we have had some people say that they're, they are fans of the series. So here's, here's my problem. And it's probably a personal thing, but when when you're writing a book you you lay down hints and what you're doing is you're laying a promise to the reader that you will pay this will pay off later if you're going huh i wonder why that happened or i wonder why i don't know that person's name you can either think the author is sloppy and the editor doesn't care or there might be a reason for that a lot of times i get dinged for that Sometimes by people rudely commenting in a con reading, sometimes my editor thinks this makes no sense, can you explain? And I'm thinking, I don't want to, because I want to explain later. Mm -hmm. And with the, with the trilogy, that's like exponentially more complex, because you have to decide what to give away in the beginning, but there's got to be something held back to really make the third one tie it up. And I know you don't want to give uh, spoilers, but 
Can you address this kind of complexity? Because it feels mysterious to me. I don't know. It's a lot. Uh, writing a trilogy is, um, isn't is just writing three books. It's like exponentially more difficult because they have to all work together to create like a super arc. So um, I think one thing that helps me is I do tend to be more of a planner up front. Um, and when I wrote the first book, I didn't know if it would sell. Uh, I wrote it on spec and I knew that it could be a longer series, but I had to make it satisfying on its own um, if I didn't get a chance to write the next books. So that's what I did. And then when my publisher said, great, we want three books, what are books two and three about? Then I had to quickly scramble to write a synopsis of what the second and third book would be. But at that point, when I knew I had three books to work with, um, I developed a a structure for myself for how they would be different from each other because I think each one has to be its own thing and and be satisfying in its own right but then ideally like they all three of them work together so um, the way I planned it out was uh, I gave myself a fence and a scaffold and the fence was okay what is this trilogy not about so it could have become this big scope creep doorstopper epic fantasy that went off into other countries and a whole other set of characters and subplots galore but I knew I didn't want that to be the case so my fence was at its heart it's a family saga so I'm gonna stick with the POV characters that are within this family and it all has to kind of come back to that and then my scaffold was, okay, I have the first book, which is really about the conflict between these two clans on the island of Kacon over Magical Jade. And the second book is going to take that storyline and expand the conflict internationally, um, which it did. And then the third book is going to do that intergenerationally. So the third book covers like 20 years of, wow. <laughs> of narrative. So each of the three books has a different feel to them, but hopefully they all built together to be one big thing to your question of like how do you decide where to reveal information and um, what to hold back um i generally don't hold anything back like my my usual mo is don't save anything like you'll always come up with something new and cool so if you have something that you want to include, like put it in the existing book that you're working on now. And for sure, there will be more cool things to include by the time you get to the next book. And I do see this sometimes with writers who are like, they're planning out a thing and they're like, well, I don't want to introduce that villain until like book two because, you know, I, I want to make them more mysterious or what, what have you. And like, you can do that, but I would generally say especially if this is like your first time writing a series and you want to you're you're not sure yet whether or not that first book is going to sell don't hold back like even if you are hoping or planning for this to be a trilogy don't keep anything in your pocket because you want to make that first book as amazing and cool as you possibly can so that it does get published and when it does you will come up with more cool stuff especially if you have events that you can explore what the consequences of them are you'll always be able to you, you might think well I, I can't i have to spread out my ideas you don't you will you'll just don't worry about running out of ideas you will you'll find a way to come up with more stuff right so you wrote jade city with hopes of a trilogy or with no expectations whatsoever did they surprise you with the request for a trilogy I had hopes for one, but I def I kept my hopes very well. Yeah, <laughs> on the down low. <laughs> like I, I had in my mind, okay, if if I get more than one book, here's like the things that I would do. But I, I definitely, I I didn't count on it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Shards has a question: Is it's okay if the timeline between books in a trilogy isn't the same, or the gap between them? Do you mean like if the first, you thought if the first gap between the first two is like a year, then the gap between the second book should be a year? Is that what you're 
Is that what you get out of that? I'm not sure. Did you understand the question, Fonda? I think, um, yeah, I, I think uh, that Charles is referring to um, the gaps between the books. Okay. And I would say it's totally fine if the timeline between them isn't the same. You have books that pick up immediately after the close of the of the previous book and you have ones that pick up like years later mm -hmm. so it just so happened that the gap between my first and second book and between my second and third book was about the same they were about a year to two years um each but it would be perfectly reasonable to have that be different because it depends on your story and where it makes sense to pick up and how much ahead in time you want to bring your readers. Yeah. Um, one thing I've done in some of my books is throw little things out, like I'll mention a brother or I'll mention I had a problem with my father or in like, if you leave that, it's fine. But it still gives you something to pick up if you think of something interesting further on in the story. So, did you find yourself doing that with... Do you work like that? or? Um... Yeah, so... Okay. Um, one thing that, is, that I find I do, and I think a lot of writers do, is go back and mine their own work for breadcrumbs. Yes. So, you get the first book done, and then... You're working on the second and um, you go back and reread your first book and there's almost always stuff mm -hmm. that you can unspool further and develop further. Just like that you unconsciously put in there. And it could be something like a minor character. It could be um, some hint about the backstory. So that happened to me when I was writing the trilogy was in the second book there's like this big climactic showdown between two characters around the middle of the book and that scene did not exist in the very first draft and it which is it's hard for me to imagine the book without that scene now because it's such an important event right. but it came about because i felt like okay the middle of the book is feeling a little it, it, it's soggy and i know i need to solve a bunch of things because like this the antagonist we haven't seen them for a while and what are they up to and i feel like this main character um hasn't uh ha it doesn't have enough going on and so i like kind of solved a bunch of problems with this one big climactic fight scene but the way that i set that up was um there's elements of that character's backstory that i hadn't um explored and i brought those back in a really consequential way. And I hadn't um, explored those in the first book because they, were kind, they weren't they were relevant to the plot of, of that first book, but they clearly had had an influence on that character. And then I had that like past come back to bite her. Um, so that was an example of like going back to your character's backstory and finding more plot there. And then another um, time that that happened was there's, uh, a character who's in the first book who uh, show who gets injured and um, they they're a, they're a secondary character a minor character and I didn't really think anything more of them but then lo and behold they walk into a, a scene in the second book and um, and I kind of use them to advance a, a element of the plot later on in that novel. So um, that's something that makes you seem really smart in hindsight <laughs> because yes. the readers are like, oh, she introduced this minor character in book one. And, you know, you could tell that this character was going to become really important because of X, Y, Z. And like, it's not necessarily that you planned it that way. It's that you were like, okay, what do I do now? And you go back to the first book and you're like, oh, that minor character, I could have, could I, I can bring them back. And it looks like you planned it all along. Yeah. Uh, to tie this in with, with NaNoWriMo, uh, one of the things I mentioned, if you, you know, you hit a wall and you don't know what happens yet in your text, uh, one of my pieces of advice is do a flashback. Go and say, 
how a, a formative moment in your main character's life, or a time when your main character and your antagonist were friends, or something like that, and that might, like, loosen you up and be able to to continue on with the story but what that will also do is can give you little plot points to mine later on in the book mm -hmm. if you hit a if you hit another wall around forty thousand words you can say well what can i take from that flashback to perhaps bring it into the story now so um let's see star eyed green says do you head do heavy outlines or story bibles or that's i think that's kind of a not an either or but what do you yeah. do to prepare I do outline, but I don't do a super heavy outline. I am um, someone who needs an outline in order to even have the courage to begin. And I think of the outline as um, a, a document that tells me where I'm going with this story. So I need to know how it ends. Um, I don't feel like I can start writing until I know where the story ends and what some of the main narrative turning points are. Mm -hmm. And then in between those, I've kind of got to um, figure out how we get from point A to B to C. Um, so I do outline and, um, but I, I don't outline super heavily. I leave some flexibility and uh, I don't, I, I don't have a story Bible, but I have a lot of just, world building and brainstorming documents so i'll just open up a new um document and scrivener and be like character brainstorm and just sort of free write a whole bunch of stuff um or about the world or about this or that plot element uh and um at the end of it all uh my copy editor editor will put together like the style guide with like all the um events and the timeline and um the names of all the characters and and all that um but i i try to keep a balance between planning everything out and also having some flexibility because i know every time i outline it changes but what helps me is to think of the outline as a living document so if i have the outline and i hit a wall in my writing rather than just staring at the screen or, or um, writing off into the woods, I'll go back to my outline and try to figure out where I last felt confident in the story and then re-outline from there. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing I've done a lot is I've backwards outlined. So yeah. if I know where the story ends, then I can try and work my way backwards and say, okay, well, then what's the second to last scene? What's the third to last scene? And then that'll kind of like eat away at my outline from the other end. And then I can kind of like, like Pac-Man, like chomp down yeah. onto the middle. Yeah, that's, that's a good idea. Um, we are nearing the end of our regular podcast time. Fonda, can you tell us uh, where to find you and your book, Jade Legacy, online? Yeah, my website is FondaLee.com. I am on Twitter at Fonda J. Lee and on Instagram at Fonda dot Lee. And you can pre-order Jade Legacy um, anywhere books are sold on, um, on Audible and your local indie bookstore. Please do pre-order. The supply chain for books is, uh, is pretty borked up right now. Yeah. So every pre-order absolutely helps and, and support your indie bookstores as well. Yes, and um, I'll be doing two giveaways, one for the chat here and one for uh, the feed people later on. If you uh, hear this before, let's say, November 15th, uh, email me with a giveaway in the subject line, and I'll enter you to in, uh, win the whole trilogy of uh, the Greenbone series. And uh, I was thinking this might be too ambitious, but if you're going to be at Worldcon and I'm going to be at Worldcon, and these guys can wait, I could have you sign the books before I mail them off to the winners. Oh, we, would you be we up for that? Absolutely can do that. Yeah, All right, totally. Cool. All right, email. That's uh, not you guys in the chat, but you guys listening later on, email me, mightymartgmail.com, uh, and put giveaway in the subject line before November 15th, and then you can enter into a chance to win the trilogy. Um, yeah, and you can see more about me at Merverse.com, Twitter, I'm Mighty Mer, Twitch, I'm Mighty Mer, uh, Instagram, I'm Mighty Mer 2, which is, you know, 
mistake with a Hotmail account, I think, a long time ago. And, um, yeah, I, I'm also doing daily NaNoWriMo episodes. I hope you're doing it. I'm not sure when this is going to go live, so uh, I can't tell you what number sh you should have today. But for me, today it's 3,333. Thir yeah, 3,333. But, uh, yeah, we'll see you guys on Thursday, 3 o'clock Eastern Time. And until then, you should be writing. You should be. Yes. I Should Be Writing is available to you under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivatives License. Theme music by John Anilio. Art by Numbers Ninja. Production by Summer Brooks. And hosting by Libsyn. Find all of this information and more at merverse.com. And remember, we can't do this without you. Thanks for your support. Doctor.